All right, everybody. Hey, welcome to Note Night in America. Happy Monday evening. Happy International Women's Day, ladies out there. Y'all are all winners, women in notes. All right. Uh, glad to have y'all here. It has been a great day, a great Monday. It might be a little gray and nasty outside, but inside is full of light and uh, things are rocking and rolling along. I've got a little skip in my step. Really enjoyed putting this webinar together today. I have to tell you about this. Sometimes when Monday night rolls around or even Sunday night, I'm like, ah, crap, what am I going to talk about the next day? And as I was looking through things, you know, those past moments and things like that, something popped up that I was just really surprised about. And today's an anniversary day of well, one of the first big deals that I did with a, a huge bank. You know, obviously one of the big, I guess you could say 10 banks out there. And I thought, what a great way to talk about. What a great thing to talk about. Because I remember how scared shitless I was to get this deal done and how nervous I was in submitting the bids and making the phone calls and, and going from there. So I thought I would share a, a deal and kind of walk you through it a little bit as best as I can. And it was really enjoyable going through my emails to find lists and finding things about this deal that things that sprung about from it. And so I encourage you to ask questions. And if you're scared or nervous about doing your, your, your first deal, you've been educating yourself, you're over-educated, uh, uh, you're over-motivated, but under deleated. <laughs> Um, I think we're going to have fun tonight with it here. And I encourage you, pick up the phone, give me a holler, talk with scottcarson.com. If you're one of those that are hitting mind blocks and then just struggling a little bit, you guys know, hopefully you all know that I care, love each and everybody here that are on here. And I want you guys to experience the type of day that I had today it, because it's a great day, not only closing on a deal, but getting approval on a couple more and seeing some other things pop up that just really makes it a great Monday. And so um, I'm honored to have you guys here. Note Night in America. Happy International Women's Day. Like I said, love you all. And let's get into the content tonight. So closing your first note deal. Now, um, we all have to start somewhere, ladies and gentlemen. I can't get you out of the starting blocks. And the, and the sad thing out there with all the people that we've taught over the last 10 years since 2010 or 12, I don't remember when I started first started. It was right there. But really 5% of people take action. And out of that 5%, there's you know about 20%, 1% of people really do this on a full-time basis, really have economic impact in their bottom line. I've seen people that have closed deals, you know, they make 30, 40 grand and then they stopped doing it and they went to go back to the job, which it just blew my brain out. You know, just absolutely, uh, I just don't understand. And anyway, but tonight, like I said, we all got to start somewhere. <coughs> People love looking at deals, but confused, they get confused or scared to take action. Yeah, we all love jumping on Watermark Exchange or Paper Stack or LoopNet or Note Expo or whatever it might be to look at deals. And we, when we go in through workshops, oh, I want to look at the spreadsheets. But then it's like, ah, what am I going to do? Or how do I make a bid? Or what do I do next? Which is just pick something and take action. So I'm going to walk you through exactly what I did on this first one and how you can actually basically just do the exact same things that I did to rinse and repeat step a step exactly what I did and there'll be a few things I'm gonna skim over I'm not gonna dive it dive into we'll look into collateral files or anything like that I'll give you a brief look on that stuff but uh step a step what I did and you can honestly guys and gals you can replicate this this is not a difficult thing to do okay and I'm going to tell you right now, yes, I was a scared little boy, well, little man, I guess you'd say, when I did this, but I was very highly motivated. And we think back, and I think back to 2010, I'd been divorced for two years. I had a couple deals that were just eating my freaking lunch as the market was crashing out there. I mean, if you know anybody who was a fix and flipper, I had houses, uh, you know, I had a couple rehabs. I was living in a five-bedroom I'm sorry, four bedroom, five bath, five bedroom, four bath, 4,400 square foot house on an acre, me and my dog and my cat. Princess, the golden lab, and Mr. Bill, the gray tabby. And there was rooms that I'd rehab that I never stepped into once we finished repair. And it was eating my lunch. I bought it at 180, thought it was worth like 300. And then the market tanked and it went down where it was worth 150. And I was into it for close to 200. So that, another deal 
that I was so excited about. It was like my dream house, how it was set up, and it just became a nightmare. And I think a lot of people go through that. Uh, Daryl says on here, there's a lot of information to sort out. I mean, I'm not the sharpest tool machine either, but I want to do this. And you know what, Daryl? The idea is you don't have to be the sharpest tool in this shed, okay? If you keep it simple, you keep it simple, silly, um, and, and focus on a couple of things that we'll go through tonight. I know it can be very overwhelming when you get all sorts of lists in and exit strategies, pretty simple. But like I said, when I was looking at this deal, I was thinking back today how highly motivated I was when I was looking at this deal. I was making, I was, make, I was calling asset managers three days a week. I didn't have really much else going on, trying to get rid of these two investment properties. It was not fun. And I really, here's the thing, I had nothing to lose. I had nothing to lose to do. There's nothing I could do that would put me in a worse situation. Basically, not at the bottom of the barrel, but it was the bottom looking up. And I, the reason I love this deal so much is it was different than me just dealing onesie, little small onesie, twosie here and there. This was a major bank. This was a feather in my cap. And it really spawned, it pushed me to do some bigger things and going from there. And it actually all started with a deal I lost. It all started with this four, uh, you know, this was a four unit. It's the new picture of this property now on Airport Boulevard, okay? So the coin operator, it was a coin operated, coin operated laundry. They had a payday check place and there was also a Domino's pizza in here. And this was a property here in Austin, Texas. I saw it on LoopNet. I was working really excited about it. I had money lined up to take it down. And then the note got sold. And I'm like, what do you mean the note got sold on this? And I was familiar with debt. Okay. Note investing wrap around. And the realtor's like, it got sold. Greenpoint Mortgage sold the, sold the note. I'm like, really? So I went online, pulled information and Greenpoint Mortgage is, was a division of Capital One. You know, what's in your wallet? I was like, okay, so Capital One is selling small commercial. They're not really selling residential notes. So that began, I would say, maybe just determined doggone, doggone determination just to say, well, look, I'm going to get on that list. I'm going to find out and see what else they have. And so that's what I did. It all started, like I said, with this deal getting pulled out from underneath of me. Um, I was actually going to flip it. I was going to flip the property and it got sold. I don't remember exact specific details of it, but... I remember I was really disappointed, but it led to something else. So I knew, I knew that Capital One was selling notes. Okay. I knew it was selling notes because that's what happened. I could see the assignment. Some of the things I've talked to you about before in previous workshops. So I started reaching out. Okay. I would spend like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of a week calling asset managers. And I would say dialing for dollars, like something out of the pursuit of happiness or something of the Wolf of Wall Street, knocking out 50, 100 phone calls. So I spent from that point on, I spent like at least three weeks calling an asset manager, like four days a week. And over the three weeks, I made it a special purpose to call trying to track down Capital One. I wasn't just calling Capital One, but over that three-week period, I know that there were at least 70 phone calls I made to Capital One, trying to get to the right department. And I joke about this. I got transferred so many times to Pakistan or India or call centers, and I have to start all over again. And finally, through a couple, like using leveraging LinkedIn and finally get bounced around and finally eliminate, probably the process of elimination of every extension at Capital One, I got into the right person on the phone, Amy Grasso. She's no longer there. Um, she's moved on for Capital One, but I have to give a lot of credit to Amy. We had a great conversation on the phone. She sent me a non-disclosure agreement, which I signed and got that back into him. And then she sent me this list their first huge list of small balance commercial loans. Small balance, not residential loans. Small balance, sub 2 million, really sub million for the most part. But I found that list of it. And I've been looking and looking in my emails for this list over the last you know, month or two because I said, oh, God, I got to find it. You know, I was almost pulling out my old laptop trying to see what's on there. But I finally tracked it down in my email and I was cracking them up. And I was just laughing at it, looking at this list today, seeing the limited information on the spreadsheet, and I was able to pull something out of my, I hate to say it out of my woo, uh, but really making something work, okay? I didn't have near the information that you see on spreadsheets today, and I really had become the Sherlock Holmes of uh, the deal to try to find it out. But here's the first, basically, page. Actually, this is page two, or sorry, page three. And you hear me talk about this. This is a 31 page, there's actually a cover page to it that was uh, basically blank, but 32 pages. And this is small font. Can you agree? It is so freaking small. 
And this all their balances, you can see it's all, most of it's under uh, under a million. You got this, uh, this oh yeah, this is a uh, apartment in LA, okay? 533 Fedora Street, this was a nice one. We actually ended up flipping this one and making a hundred grand on this. This is a 16 unit apartment complex. But anyway, I get this list and I'm flipping through it, look at Texas, don't really think, and I, I flip back to California and I see San Diego. And I'm like, huh. So I Google it, you can see on it, 4725 Mansfield Street, 4, 468 was the balance. They said it was originated in 2006. It was originated about four years earlier. 468,000, interest only 7.13%. Okay. 30 uh, year term. <laughs> okay. And they were 80 months through it. And they weren't paying it. The original appraisal was 720,000. And the appraisal had gone down to 699. That's all the information I had on this originally. And I'm like, oh, okay, but 31 pages of stuff, I picked this one out of there, okay? And if you Google 4725 Mansfield Drive, there it is. That's the apartment complex. Picture of what it looked like that day, okay? And found this photo in my mass wealth of photos we've taken, and I just cracked up about it. But anyway, so I started my due diligence. I started doing due diligence on this spreadsheet by Googling it, looking at it. Uh, I found out it was an eight unit apartment complex. It's eight one ones. Um, I called the for rent sign on the photo and they told me that they had seven of them rented and they're renting for about $800 a month. And it's a very similar in this area. I think it's the historic Abrams area uh, in San Diego. There's a lot of these small apartment complexes all up and down the road. Okay, so similar properties, similar comps, pretty easy to find comps on this thing. Uh, and you could find, if you just Googled the addresses, you'd find plenty of investors there that wanted to buy it in the neck of the woods, okay? But you can see uh, what they didn't show is what we found out is that the appraisal was 699, UPB 468, there was a second on it for hundred grand. So the borrower owed 468 plus change they hadn't paid on in, in quite a few months and they had a private second for hundred grand on it, okay? So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, it's worth 699 what's a number I can get it under value or get it under contract for that maybe I can flip it? Because I needed cash. I mean, who doesn't need cash, right? I need cash was king to pay some bills and get some things taken care of. And I'm like, okay, it's operated the guys in his own personal team. Last name Jimenez was using it. Michaela Jimenez actually the borrower's name at the time. I said, I got to find a number. And I'm like, uh, e, what should I offer? And so I made an offer at 375 thinking it was way too low, okay? Uh, you don't have to be a genius. Three seventy-five is a pretty good price on a comp of six ninety-five, right? Three or uh, six ninety-nine. Three seventy-five divided by six ninety-nine comes out to you know fifty-three point six percent on an apartment. These days, it's unheard of, right? Anybody, everybody would slice their grandmother's throat in California to get one of these things. Okay. Besides the fact that it was cash flowing pretty good. All right. So 375, I thought it was too low. I remember making the, my, writing up my LOI, sent it in to Amy, and guess what? They said yes. And I was so excited, but then I was like, oh my God, I'm scared. <laughs> you know, it's the whole time, oh, I'm so excited, yay. And then you go, oh shit, what do I do now, right? And I'm like, uh, I asked for 60 days due diligence and they came back and gave me 45 which was great because I was afraid I would have to do it in 30 days, which might be kind of tight. And you'd have a lot of experience, right? And I didn't have to put any earnest money down. I was so, I thought I'd have to wire in earnest money, which I didn't have in my account. And they're like, no, nah, we just sent, just sent us a wire and you close in 45 days. And I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Okay. I was like, I think I can make this work. I can make this work. So I signed the loan sale agreement. Okay. And I got the busy marketing and the loan sale agreement there's the first page of it, you know, between Greenpoint Mortgage um, and uh, and Inverse Investments. My address, one three yep, North Highway one eighty three. It's my the PO box just down the street here, and you can see the price in the page two three hundred seventy five thousand. I agreed upon, and I'm like, man, I don't have three seventy five. I, I you know, so I'm thinking this is a price that I could probably flip. Okay, anybody feeling that they've ever done a deal that you're like, oh shit. If I get this done, I can make this happen, but it scares you to death a little bit. Right? I mean, everybody, I guess your first deal, your first flip, your first commercial deal, whatever it was. And I had done some onesie twosie, you know, residential flips, residential notes. I mean, I flipped a lot of property here in Austin, Texas and stuff like this. 
but this was technically the biggest asset, especially being outside of St. Austin. It was one of the bigger deals that we're doing. So it's pretty like, yay, you know, Daryl, you mentioned you raise your hand. Thank you for sharing. And so I'm like, okay, let's get rock and roll. So what happened next? So the clock is ticking, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. So I started immediately reached out to my coach. Okay, my mentor at the time. And you know what? Uh, it was not the best experience. He was too busy. He was out of town. He was too busy. This is a guy that I learned a note business from and made a lot of money. I was like, uh, you know, the mortgage company wasn't around. I wasn't working his office anymore. We were so close, but I reached out to him because I was like, hey, can you help me? And he was too busy. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to do this on my own. So I called a local friend out in San Diego. I said, hey, do you mind? Can you drive by the property and take some photos for me? And she did that. She went by him, took some photos, sent them over to me. Uh, my goal, like I said, I was like, okay, I'm going to try to wholesale this and make 50 grand in my pocket. I'm going to try to put 50 grand in my pocket. All right. Try to hold this for, wholesale it for 425. That should leave plenty of meat on the bone, you know, 425 divided by 699. That's still at 60, 61 cents on the dollar. That's not too bad. All right. 50 K profit. It's, it's, it's a good thing. Okay. I posted this everywhere without the address. You know, it's in San Diego apartment. Here's the thing I want you to pay attention to ladies and gentlemen, you guys can all go right now to watermark exchange, uh, paper stack, other places and find a deal, work through it, start posting it, taking different photos of it, other photos online and literally start marketing it to find somebody to buy it from you and then go sign on your contract if you can, if you want to do that. Also, me, a big thing here, I had my name on a contract. I was invested, okay? None of this like, oh, maybe I had my name on a contract and I was going to blow a major opportunity if I didn't close on this thing, okay? So I posted it to craigslist.com, to meetup groups that were around barely. If you remember the old postlets.com, I created a postlets.com listing that linked to like 60 other real estate websites, back page and from others. I posted a Facebook group. I posted to my LinkedIn profile. I even wrote a blog about the deal on my old blogging thing called hubpages.com, okay? And then I took it another step forward. I pulled up my spreadsheet, you know, those business cards, those, you know, those archaic paper things you get when networking. I was diligent about keeping a list of every contact. I mean, this is before they had the card scan thing and stuff like that. So I went on to my spreadsheet and I pulled everybody up that lived in California and I sent an email out to them you know, BCC to everybody on my list in and around San Diego and Southern California. I didn't have, didn't have MailChimp at the time. Like I said, I didn't have money to pay for my MailChimp bill, but I sent out through Gmail and I sent every investor that I know in my database. Okay. Now what happened next? Okay. Um, Capital One, they sent all at the same time, they sent over a uh, copy of their appraisal, their BPO, their loan docs, payment history, all the due diligence. It sh guess what shows up in my mailbox, in my office, the CD-ROM. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> it was just, it just said Mansfield on it. And so um, I kind of cracked up, but it's like, okay. So I was looking at it, pulling this information, looking through things, looking through all the stuff there, doing my own diligence so I could talk about the deal. I know that the borrowers, I think he was 18 months behind, had been very, uh, not very, been very kind to the guys that were and the servicers that were calling. Okay. I knew the deal inside out. I knew what the, that the market rent was right there. I knew there was some upside. He was a little below. He could probably get 900 to a thousand a month instead of $800 a month. I knew that he had some upside to what he was doing. So what was great is with the marketing I did, like the first week I had six people uh, actually reached out and called me. And four of them signed NDAs, okay? Two people didn't want to sign an NDA. And I'm like, I'm not going to disclose the address. I'm not going to give you all the due diligence docs. No, I'm not going to share a copy of the contract until you sign the NDA. And four of them did. And one was my buddy, you can see here, Matt Harder. And Matt, it was kind of a funny story. Matt at the time was kind of a new investor, uh, new to commercial investing. He was looking for some stuff there in San Diego. He lived in San Diego. He was a teacher uh, in San Diego. I don't remember what grade he taught, but this guy is absolutely fit. Ladies, you can wash your clothes on his like 12 pack abs. Okay. Absolutely great. Uh, his wife, lovely lady, he had three young kids. 
um, like I said, relatively new note investor. And I'd met Matt at an event that he'd come to in Austin that my, my mentor was teaching at. And he was one of the guys that emailed out. But Matt um, didn't get my email. He, for some reason, he didn't see my email at all. Okay. But he did see me. I post on social media. So the reason I bring that up is some of you guys only post to one or two things or you're scared to send an email blast out. You got to post multiple places. Because if I hadn't posted to social media, I just relied on my emails to go out because I was comfortable with that. Matt would have never funded the deal. Okay. Matt would have never done something. Now, that's not saying I wouldn't have had a few other people do it, but I felt much more comfortable because I'd known Matt. I'd actually, you know, we'd eaten dinner together. We'd, we'd hung out a little bit at the different event. And so he knew me on a first name basis. I knew him on a first name basis. Okay. And he saw my posts on social media. He signed my NDA. And I, once he signed my NDA, I was glad to share everything in a, uh, I think it was a Dropbox folder we I uploaded everything to. And he started looking at it too. And he provided proof of funds that he could fund on the deal for the most part. So, you know, he's looking through this and he comes back to me and goes, Scott, I would, I really want to do this deal. I said, but I can only pull together 410 between me and my two uh, family members, two friends. They had 410. I was like, you know what? Can you close? by such and such a date. And he was like, yep, I can close. I said, let's do it. I'll give you a $15,000 discount. You know, it may seem big, but 35, 100% of 35 was better than 100% of nothing. Okay. And so it didn't take long. I was like, yeah, if you can close between before we are supposed to, we can do this. I'll, I'll give you a discount because I know, yeah, we'll do some other deals together. Okay. He's like, oh, awesome. So he can close in 25 days. And you realize the clock had been ticking. 10 days had already gone by for me marketing, 45 days total. So I had 35 left and I asked him, can he close in 25 days? Why did I bump that up? Because I wanted to, the, if, he, if he flaked, if he couldn't close, I still had 10 days to go to my backup offers. I still had 10 days to do things, okay? So we agreed. I sent him a new loan sale agreement. I basically took the loan sale agreement that Capital One sent me and I just changed the parties around. I upped the dates. He knew what I had it under contract for. He knew that I had it under contract for 375. I disclosed that. It was a good enough deal that I didn't, I wasn't going to argue that much about making commission. If he come back to the line, you only make three points. I tell him to go shove it. Okay. Because I knew that, Hey, okay. 35 K is still a nice chunk of change, but I was still leaving plenty of meat in the bone. Now we opened up an escrow account, literally went to my bank and said, Hey, I need to open up a separate account just for this one LLC. And it's your savings account. And they were like, okay, fine. All right. Some people you'd have a real estate attorney do that for you. And it's like 500 bucks. Okay. So on day 24, Matt wires in the money, okay? And I remember, I remember the joy of logging into my Wachovia account at the time and seeing $410,000 sitting in your account, okay? If you've never experienced that before, I hope you do at some point because it is a really joyful thing. So it'll be like, oh, oh, sorry, not 415, 410. I don't know why I typed in. Um, but 410 sitting in my account. I'm like, yay, it's not all mine though. But what I did, <laughs> I immediately went down to the bank and I wired 375 to Capital One's account. I transferred the 35K to my other business account for after receiving, uh, when I notified Capital One and called Amy and said, hey, here's the wire confirmation. She signed back a, um, oh, uh, uh, we call it a um, sign bill of sale. That's what BOS stands for, bill of sale. So that they received it. I sent that to Matt. I emailed that to Matt and said, hey, here you go. Just so you know, we wired in. And he's like, you're good to go. So then pulled the money in my account, did a happy dance, okay? And then called Capital One of name changes. So I said, hey, I need to change the names on the assignments. Now, Capital One, they didn't want to do that. They turned like, oh no, we agreed to the contract of inverse investments. So all the assignments that we do have to be inverse investments. I'm like, okay. I called Matt up. I said, can we do double AOMs? They're, they don't want to change it. Is it right when they send it to me that I just create a new AOM? He's like, that's completely fine. Okay. So the next day, Capital One sent me copies of the assignment of mortgages. I went and used those copies to create my new AOMs, went to the notary, signed them, you know, signed them notarized to from my LLC to Matt's entity. And it was pretty easy, basically two assignments and uh, everything to go along with it. Now, what happened next? Now, what did Matt do? What if Matt didn't close? What would I have done if he hadn't funded on the 25th? Besides going, oh shit, and running around, um, I would have reached out to my backup, the other guys and gals that had signed NDAs, you know? 
I had two backup buyers and funders ready to roll. They knew they were in a backup position. They knew they were happy to do the deal at the 410 number. I wasn't going to sit here if they're going to argue, oh, we wanted it at 405. Now I would have gone to the other person. Okay. Or I would have marketed back to a couple other people as well. Uh, they signed an NDA. They had, they, I gave them all their due diligence docs. I said, listen, you're backup offering on this. I have a, a guy ahead of you. He was the first one. If he doesn't come through, then I'll go with you. So be prepared if he doesn't fund. Okay. Now, what did Matt do? Obviously he funded. So it was great. I notified the two people said, listen, the guy funded, let me call you on the next one. And I ended up funding deals with both those other two people. And so they were happy. They, they were really happy anyway. So Matt, he did something cool. It took him and his two business partners about eight months to wrap up the deal. They actually reached out to the second lien holder. He was able to negotiate that down from 100K to, to 25K. And then they were actually able to, I don't remember, they ended up making $148,000 in profits. Okay, so they split that three ways, which is not a bad, I mean, if you're making what's 148 divided by three, it's almost 50 grand, right? And if he brought, he brought a third of the 410 divided by three, that's 136. So his, uh, we'll just say 50, 49. He, he made about a 36% ROI. Better than that if you annualize it because it took eight months to do that. But he got $148,000 in profits. He split that with his business partners. Now, he was a smart guy. He left his three little kids home with the grandma and he took his lovely wife to Hawaii for a week. Okay. And they lived it up. They had a great time. And the, the beautiful thing about Matt, he is no longer a teacher. <laughs> Imagine that, right? Making 48K in one deal in eight months for him compared to what he was making as a school teacher in San Diego. He was like, I'm doing this full time. Thank you, Scott. This is great. You know, now he's an investor. He stopped teaching. He does all these Ironmans. Uh, and, and the kids have just grown. They're just absolutely beautiful kids. Still great. Dinner. So important details about this that I think everybody in here needs to understand. I'm going to open it up for questions here in a second from you is know your deal. Okay. You will have so much more confidence if you act like you're buying it yourself and you know the numbers. Your people that are buying it from you, whether you're wholesaling it or flipping the contract or bringing on somebody to take it off, they're going to love it more when you they know that you know the deal. In some cases, I've wholesaled properties but stayed into the deal for you know a little bit on the back end to help somebody walk themselves through it. So yeah, I'll walk you through it. Here's the deals. We'll go from there. Okay, Put it under contract and don't be afraid to ask for more time. Here's the one big thing. If I could, I, if I would have been able to close in 45 days, I would have asked for more time. Okay. So listen, I just had my funder fall out. Can I come back with you? Here's, I got two guy backup buyers with that. That's why the backups are so important. Okay. On a commercial deal, 30 days is pretty normal for a, a one-off. Now on a residential deal, a one-off should be like seven days, seven to 14 days at the most. Okay not 30 days, not 45 days for a one-off residential note, but for commercial property, something like that, that's kind of normal. Banks are used to that. So I don't mind pushing and say, hey, can I get can I get 60 days? And they're like, well, we really said, okay, what about 45 days? And, and you know, I, you, if you want 45, ask for 60. If you want 30, ask for 45. What's the worst they say? No, okay. And then don't give it me 30. And I could have done it in 30, but I was like, I want a little bit extra time just for, you know, for who knows what, okay? Know the profit potential for you and your buyers. That's important thing. Yes, I took a little bit of discount. I gave Matt a discount. I could have made 15 grand more probably if I really got down to it, but it was more comfortable knowing that it was a win-win. It was a win for me at 35K. It was a win for Matt as well. Yeah, he made a little bit more money in the long run. You figure out return on investment. I came out good because I made 35 grand with zero dollars invested. Matt made what 49 plus he had a hundred and was it 140 of his own money into the deal. Okay. So keep that in mind. Know what's in it for. I knew the cap rates. I knew that they were leased. I'd done the due diligence for them and really kind of put it on a silver platter. And be flexible. As I said about this, hey, be flexible. If somebody comes and says they're a little tight, yeah, you probably if I could have put them to the screws, but you know, let's do a deal. Let's make it make a win-win. Okay. And here's another thing, market it everywhere. If I hadn't, if I just relied on my email, Matt wouldn't have called me. If I had just posted on social media, other people would have seen me. So market the deal everywhere and don't take no for an answer. I should have said this on the front end. 
I can't tell you how many times I got told no, 50, 60 times of no, we don't sell notes. And I'm like, that's BS. I know you do. Okay. I know you sell one-off stuff. I know you're on a small side of things. So I didn't take no for answer. I just pulled my hair out and I would start fresh the next day. Okay. And always, always get back at buyers or funders just in case. Even if you've got your, this is the big mistake I see people. They get, they get lazy in marketing. Oh, I've dealt with this person. I sold, you know, I had another student of mine like, oh, I sold this guy 20 houses before. I said, well, houses are different than note deals. Okay. There's a lot of difference. Like I wired four, you know, $375,000 to an account and I didn't have an assignment until the next day. It's not closing at a title company, okay? This is different, all right? It's not the same thing, okay? And for, for fun, make sure when you do get the social proof, you, you take that screenshot. I can't tell you, I probably used that uh, bank statement showing 410 in my account as proof of funds for like a, um, two months. <laughs> and it helped me, it gave me confidence because then I went and made more offers. And I can't tell you, once I got that first deal done, whoo! Capital One and I had a great relationship, great relationship. Bought numerous deals from Capital One and Amy Grasso over there. And yeah, you know, my next deal was a 24 unit in Houston that I made 50 grand on in profit wholesale on the note as well, 24 unit, a 21 unit and a 50 unit in DFW that we ended up making 30K and 75K on. Uh, I sold a beer barn. I, they had this small one. I was just, you know, screenshotting and looking at Google Maps. And I saw that was a beer distributor in a beer barn. So I put it under contract at a big discount and I just flipped it for 10 grand to the distributor there. And it was a win-win. Uh, I had five sent to me from Capital One, five different deals that I think I made over 100K, slightly over 100K between those five. But it, they contacted me when they had another buyer flake out. And you have, this one of the most important things about following up and being able to close or just get rock and roll. Uh, I remember getting a phone call from me. She's like, hey, Scott, my apology. I didn't send you an updated list. I've got a couple deals on here that, you know, if you can come close to what we're looking for, I'd rather do, I'd do the deal with you because I like working with you. Okay. And she, and she always, she loved uh, when I would send photos. Like there's this one 70 unit apartment complex in Miami Beach that was just a shell. And it was literally something like a crack house. And I mean it seriously. When I sent my realtor, Ozil, out there, um, he took pictures. He called me back and goes, man, it's crack. It's crack. It's crackhead. Rabbit. I took these photos and you see crackhead speaking out from the mattresses and windows are shot out. And I forward that over and I get a phone call from Amy and you can hear her and the other people laughing at the photos. And they're like, uh, how much are we going to have to pay you versus you paying us for this? And that's the kind of relationship you want to develop with your asset manager. And Capital One, they got tighter and tighter. Then they had to pause all of their commercial sales for a while and then start back up but they also referred me to two people. I got referrals from other funds and institutions that contacted me because Amy referred them to me because like, oh, call Scott, you have a deal that fell through. And one of those was an eight, uh, eight unit apartment or six unit apartment complex in West Palm Beach that we made a chunk of change on, okay? I, it was also funny, <laughs> you never know what's gonna happen. But I then get a phone call from the San Diego district attorney's office one day and the guy's asking me, he's like, can you tell me what you do? I've introduced himself. And I'm like, uh. And it turns out there was a guy that uh, was using a note deal and raising capital from like 30 people. He's saying he was calling himself a doctor when he wasn't even a doctor. And so we were able to actually help the San Diego district attorney help stop this fraud case at the county level. So that was kind of cool. It came from capital. We got capital one involved. And uh, the guy was creating false assignments and false entities. And it was just, it was just a weird situation, but it was helpful. But the biggest thing too, you have other things happened. Like just being on the list, I ended up getting connected to 468 other note investors on Capital One because Amy's assistant sent an email blast out and CC'd everybody instead of blind CNC, you know, blind carbon cops, she just carbon cops. So I basically had another list of investors that I could reach out to. So you never know what you're going to get if you just keep pushing. I can't tell you how many other deals and stuff like that. It's just, it, I like to say it's a million dollar relationship with a big bank like that um, because it really is. If you think about what you're getting funds in and how you're moving things and the profit, you know, this is why I tell you guys and I tell everybody that I see, look, the banks will sell to you if you know what you do. I had a LinkedIn profile. I, I knew what to say. 
but I didn't have a lot of experience. I mean, at the time, 375 was the most expensive really note deal that I'd actually was the most expensive property that I ever bought at that time or controlled. And like, if I had to put, you know, 1% down in earnest money, 3,700, I wouldn't be able to do the deal, but I was able to work it. And that's what I love about notes is that literally that list. And I've got the full list here. I just want to, I just want to share with you just a little bit. You know, when you skip lists like this, this is just not your usual spreadsheet note investor list. Okay. And you know, and you see the cities, this California, the light industrial, the mixed use with residential, mixed use without residential, the multifamily, you know, uh, and they do this by state by state. That's California, Colorado, Connecticut, you know, Florida. Oh my gosh, all the stuff in Florida. We picked up quite a few in Florida from this list. And just going through this, you don't know what you don't know. And this is the kindest stuff. This is what I get so excited about, ladies and gentlemen. This is the kind of stuff that you're going to start seeing again because it's the small balance commercial stuff. This is the stuff that's clogging up the arteries of the banks and you can rinse and repeat. And often, Hey, banks will give you, I've had closings that I didn't get done in 45 days that I pushed to 60 days and capital one is willing to work with me on it. They're like, that's fine. Close on it. When you can close on it this week or next week, we know you're good for it. Okay. Or deals are like, listen, I can't, can't do this deal. The due diligence this property is horrible. And they're like, oh, that's fine. No, no problem. Get the next one. So I share this with you because these types of deals, think about this, 31 pages with roughly, was that 20 to 25 assets per one. They're all at least usually somewhere between 200. So that's a lot of deals out there if you just can reach out to it. And I know somebody asked me, well, why'd you pick San Diego versus, or why'd you pick California versus Texas? I'm like, uh, I like San Diego, you know? Um, we ended up this 3232 East Abram Street was one of the next one. The 1625 Grigsby Avenue was another one we did. We made a bid on this Cleveland Street one. So I ended up, San Diego was one because I thought would be the easiest and I wanted to do a deal in California. But this Arlington and these three Dallas ones were the next ones down my list that we took down. Okay. And you never know what you're going to see with a conversation. And I'll tell you right now, you get a list like this, something in, great. Hey, I'm glad to help you out with it. I'm glad to walk you through it and what to do. Uh, to make it successful, but I'm not going to do the heavy lifting for you. Okay. You're going to have to go out and find these. And even they have these REOs too. This is another one. This is all the small balances. This is all, this is their big stuff, their big balance stuff. But what I'm trying to get at ladies and gentlemen, is that you guys are all capable of doing this. You're all capable of really taking your game to a whole other level. If you'll just stick with it and get rocking and rolling and make some things happen. So I want to open it up for questions, comments, concerns. I think that property's probably been sold two or three times. I know Matt has bought quite a few other deals for the most part. But what's funny <laughs> is that that commercial deal helped me out doing so much more. I just had this confidence and you know, I'm not afraid to make offers on big stuff. And we ended up, I ended up buying a million dollar condo loan uh, in Naples, or not a condo, it was a house, some of the things. If you know the markets, know what's going on. Now, I wouldn't buy a four, you know, average house here in Austin is like 400,000. Okay, I might do that. I prefer the lower balance stuff, 200 and under. But if you know the markets and know what's available and know a deal when you see it, great. Today, if I had that same type of deal, guess what? I know I could make it up. I'd probably flip it for 100 grand at this time now. I don't think I'd hold on to it because the cap rates are so low, they're in the neck of the woods. But you never know. Know your money costs, know what you have available. And you know what? You learn more by pushing yourself in your outside of your comfort zones than you ever will be by hiding out, staying in your safe place. Safe equals broke. All right. You got to get out there. You got to expand your horizons. You got to make offers, ladies and gentlemen. You got to go out and find deals and make things happen. So questions, comments, concerns from you. Hope it was entertaining, if not educational, for sure. Um, Sylvia asked a question, marketing the deal out everywhere after you sign the NDA, is there a possibility that the banker might see it? I've had that happen a couple of times, once or twice um, when a banker saw it. It wasn't any of my own deals. It was a student's, and what she did stupidly is she was connected with the asset manager on LinkedIn and then she used the actual full address. She didn't take the address off, didn't change anything up and shared, shared the wrong thing. Now I've had people contact me, like I've had Peter Slagovitz you guys may know him. I've had David Polio contact me when they've seen people posting things. Look, I'd signed the NDA and I had it under contract and I was marketing it 
simply to help raise capital. And that's the thing. I didn't share the address publicly. I didn't see it was with Capital One at the time. Um, if you sign that NDA, hey, you're just trying to market. You're trying to make some things happen. No, if you're connected with the asset manager on LinkedIn, I know necessarily I'd be posted to LinkedIn. Does that make sense? The idea here is to ask, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission, okay? You know, that's why I don't put the address on the assets. I, that's why, I, you know, until after you've closed on it, then that's when you would put the address down. But good question, Celia. Um, I have a single family home worth 38K. Our ARV is about 140K. How do I buy the note? I, well, I'm not into the fix and flip stuff. I don't care about ARV, uh, Will. Who's the bank? It all comes down to who the bank is. All right. If the bank is willing to play ball, great. You got to contact the asset manager. You may want to sign up for our note weekend class at noteweekend.com. Probably better for you to sign up for our note buying for dummies workshop to go more into that versus trying to teach you how to buy a note on a Monday night conference call. Okay. But thanks for asking. Uh, I know a lender and Daryl says, I know a lender who would lend me 50%. What websites can I go to to find maybe a multifamily note? Here's the thing. You're probably not going to find multifamily notes. Just sit down on websites. If you do, they probably don't make a lot of sense, Daryl. If you're multifamily is the most overpriced asset uh, classification right now, going for uh, ridiculous numbers, stupid, stupid numbers. So go find you a single family note. Look at what you want to accomplish. What do you need? If a lender is going to fund you 50%, is that 50% of the purchase price? You still would need to come up with the other 50%. Now, if you're using your own funds, great, kudos. But if you need other people's money, then go find a deal. Um, yeah, go find asset managers. Go reach out to people. This is the stuff that we preach. Okay, go contact banks, jump on Ling Guy, jump on a variety of things. Anything we've talked about um, to do, you know, like everything we've talked about in note buying for dummies is the best thing. Will, you asked the question, if you go to weclosenotes.com and look at the training, you'll see the drop down. So it's a virtual workshop where you can go to notebuyingfordummies.com. We'll take you there as well. Okay. But just get out, start talk, contacting people, go to some of the websites we've talked about. We've talked about more uh, some of the lending platforms or the note platforms on the 20 day note investing challenge too, guys and gals. Here's the thing. I learned more from taking action. Yes, I dialed for dollars. I got yeses, I got no's. I had some other tapes that came in. Flip the smaller stuff, right? You're going, just most of you aren't taking action. Most of you are sitting in your comfort zone. You're not doing the simple things and you're playing at this instead of treating this as a serious business. And for those guys and gals out there that get really serious, especially the next 90 days, we're going to see some things burst when they finally stop this foreclosure moratorium. And there's opportunities everywhere. There's a lot of opportunities in the small balance commercial space, not apartments, but student housing and other places out there. Heck, empty hotels you can turn into apartments. There's some opportunity out there for you too. So check out our virtual workshop. Actually, our next virtual three-day workshop is actually going to be the end of this month. The last weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It was supposed to be a couple of weeks ago. Unfortunately, couldn't do it. Then we had a delay, but it's actually going to be the last three days. Last weekend, last Friday, Saturday, Sunday of this month. So don't have to wait till then. You can get signed up and we get the replays out to you ahead of time so you can watch and learn and be much more ready to rock and roll. So any other questions, comments, concerns, just market. Marketing is all about sharing everywhere, okay? Catherine, look forward to talking to you guys tomorrow, okay? Thanks. I thank you so much. I'm so glad Steve is back healthy from the COVID. Glad to see him back. I was a little surprised to see him wearing a Yankees jersey uh, being from Boston. But anyway. All right, everybody. Thank you again so much. There's no other phone call, no other questions have a great evening. Go out, take some action. Happy, once again, ladies, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you all at the top, everybody. Bye. Good night.